You're live on DSTV Channel 41, Go TV 144. This is Johnny Prime with me on this main headlines this arm. It has emerged that government spent about 10 million Ghana cities on a national consultative dialogue on illegal mining. The minority is incensed about this expenditure. More than 10 conferences and dialogue. And this is a document from the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources during the consideration stage of the 2022 budget estimate. Mr. Speaker, 10 million Ghana cities just on conferences and dialogue on how to fight Galamse in this country. Tonight, we asked what solutions could government be looking for when a similar document uh, exercise was held in 2017. We'll speak to the Deputy Land Minister, George Mikuduka, and also a former boss of the Minerals Commission, also here on Joint News Prime. Meteorological Agency warns motorists to take precaution as visibility could reduce substantially following its detection of a heavy storm that could have damaging effect on weak buildings and lo loose tree branches. Motorists, this is the time we should reduce our speed. Right, right. Visibility also drops, mm. especially when it's moderate to severe. We we'll hear from the agency and not more on its preparedness for the rainy season. Also, here on Join News Prime Ghana Education Service calls for police investigations into allegations that some of its top officials and staff at the Education Ministry are extorting money from parents to place their schools in certain schools. General actually wrote to the Ghana Police Service to IGP. He also wrote officially to NIB, former BNI, um, for independent investigations into some of these claims. At 8 p.m., I'll hand over to Beverly for Prime Business. What should we look forward to? So, government is set to engage Dangote fertilizers to address the fertilizer shortage in the country. So, yeah, we just launched this uh, Dangote fertilizer in Nigeria. It's a huge uh, edifice that we, we, we've had in our sub region. And at 8 30 pm, we are Prime Sports Oreku. What's up? Oh, we hear from left by Gideon Mensa as he believes the technical team of the Black Star should be kept for the 2022 World Cup. Being part of the playing body, I, I think uh, we, we, we love the atmosphere uh, around these this three, uh, this three coaches. I mean, Pidi Ramani, Kotoado, and Judge Watson. And later in the bulletin, a warning to young men like Oreku. Those are fro aphrodisiacs that uh, you take. You don't know what. Yes, you want to perform. But usually if you eat well, you exercise well, you should be able to perform. You know, wonderfully. Exactly. Yes. So please, avoid the aphrodisiac. Try and stay away from you them. You shouldn't kill them. Hopefully, Oreku will listen. I'm NS Min. We have details of this and more here on Journeys, your home of independent, fearless, and credible journalism. Stay tuned. In. Hello again. Thanks for choosing us. Now, the deputy ranking on the Lands and Forestry Committee of Parliament has taken on government for searching for new solutions to the Galamsey menace as it emerges. Uh, government spent about 10 million Ghana cities on the National Consultative Dialogue on Illegal Mining last year. In 2017, when the initial war on uh, the illegality was waged by the Kufuado administration, a comprehensive document, that's the multi-sectorial mining integrated project, was produced with recommendation to give a permanent fix to the challenge in five years. But five years on, government is yet to spend a huge amount of money to embark on a similar exercise to solicit views on dealing with same monster called Galamse. A TV Dries has won the following report. Expenditure for the recently held National Consultative Dialogue about the menace of illegal mining has come under scrutiny as the minority in Parliament describes as outrageous the 10 million Ghana cities spent on the engagement. With the challenges posed by the menace of illegal mining, the Lands and Natural Resources Ministry in 2021 organized a National Consultative Dialogue in Accra, Tamale, and Kumase to solicit views, proposals and suggestions on how to deal with the threat of Galamse in Ghana. But that will not be the first consultative engagement on illegal mining under this government. When President Ekufuado commenced the most aggressive war yet on illegal mining in 2017, the administration, with support from the European Union, held similar exercise with experts in the mining and extractive industry, traditional authorities and stakeholders from the mining regions of the country. 
that national engagement produced the multi-sectoral mining integrated project MMIP document. Curiously though, recommendations in the MMIP document, a five-year project that presents an integrated approach for achieving overall project outcomes and deliverables and represents a framework for collaboration with key stakeholders to sanitize the small-scale mining industry have barely been fully implemented. Apart from concerns about undertaking an exercise to solicit for information that is already captured in an already existing document, the minority in parliament is equally concerned about the amount of money the ministry says it spends on the consultative engagement. It cost the taxpayer 2 million and 40,000 Ghana cities to organize the national dialogue on small-scale mining here in Accra. 2.1 million Ghana cities just to organize a dialogue on how to, to fight Galamse in this country. Mr. Speaker, the regional dialogue and small-scale mining for Northern and Middle Belt came up to 3.7 million Ghana cities. 3.7 million Ghana cities just to organize dialogue series across the regions on how to fight Galamse. Mr. Speaker, the regional talks that were engaged in by the minister and his appointees cost the taxpayer 5.4 million Ghana cities. All of this put together, Mr. Speaker, we are talking about more than 10 conferences and dialogue. And this is a document from the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources during the consideration stage of the 2022 budget estimate. Mr. Speaker, 10 million Ghana cities just on conferences and dialogue on how to fight Galamse in this country. MMIP barely implemented, it begs the question why the ministry would want to spend so much to embark on another engagement to find solutions that are already captured in an already existing document. Let's go to Zoom now and speak to Tony Obin, who is a former director of the Minerals Commission. Uh, Doc, I'm grateful for your time here on Join News Prime. Uh, you were in office when the 2017 dialogue happened. Uh, after the document was put together, uh, what, what happened from there? You'd have to unzoom, uh, Dr. Tony Oben, you'd have to unzoom your device uh, and mute, okay. I beg your pardon. Yeah. All right, so, so good evening to your viewers. Um, I am surprised at the you know, multiplicity of efforts in trying to address this uh, obviously very challenging issue of, 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 uh, of Galamse in this country. Um, and before this government came into power, the previous government had done a paper, in fact, a comprehensive study on how to address the, the menace. This document, when the new government came, found its way into the MMIP. So basically, the MMIP was uh, a collection of opinions, but also documents that had been transferred from the previous regime into the new one. The solutions to illegal mining problems is not new. There have been a lot of studies, both private, academic, and institutional. And so this, the solution is, has never been a problem. I would be very curious to find out what else has been discovered as a key to the solution from all the consultations that have been, been done. I am not going to talk about the amount spent because that is not in my, uh, you know, that's not my, in, my, in my purview, but really the essence of the multiplicity of, you know, looking for solution to a problem that has been overly studied, that has all the records there, uh, that only have to be implemented and enforced. Mm. So and I, that I, question I am at about what else government to... could be looking for, uh, we'll put that to the Deputy Minister when we get him. He, he's booked to speak to us tonight here on Join News Prime. Uh, once we have him, we'll put that question to him. But on the MNIP, uh, what was the level of imp implementation as far as that document is concerned? Well, I, I, I left the scene after, I think, um, after eight or nine months of, of being there. And uh, so, so the implementation, I wouldn't know, but I knew that the document was the source uh, of the application for, for support from the World Bank. Mm. So the World Bank, has, I think, has advanced Ghana about $250 million, if I remember correctly. And that was based 
on, on, on the MMIP documents. So I would, I would, I would believe that I would, have, I would think that they would implement the MMIP document, which was actually well researched and contains solutions from previous government, current government, and from academic studies as well. Mm. So um, the implementation, I wouldn't be able to, to talk much about it, but I haven't seen it being implemented. Okay. I have I've seen some consultant being appointed and all that, but I'm, we are yet to really see on the ground how it has been implemented. As far as you remember, are there areas that you, you were challenged with? Are there areas that fell short, uh, that needed some work to be done on? That perhaps could be grounds for what we are hearing now, the new consultation uh, going on uh, by this government. Well, I think the document was very comprehensive. And being part of it, I wouldn't see what the shortfalls were. And that's why I am curious to know um, what new thing was discovered as a solution to this seemingly intractable problem. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I'm, I haven't read that, so uh, I'm curious to know that. I don't know whether you have a talk of anything like that. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the problems is sort of over, over you know, Farming of on, on, on issues, issues that easily have solutions that are there, uh, that only awaits implementation, and perhaps looking for resources to implement them. So, as far as I am concerned, um, there was enough information, there was enough um, material available to support the implementation of those. Uh, the solutions. Mm. You, you say you've not seen it being implemented, but uh, just on top of your head, could you run us by some of the recommendations uh, that the document made as far as dealing with Galamse is concerned? Uh, yes, I'm just on top of my head. I think we, we saw that uh, education sensitization was a key area. Mm. We also saw that technology would be very central, central in resolving this. In fact, in my time, we were looking at actually uh, digitizing the process. We have even started digitizing the processes and then trying to track track the, the, the excavators and all that. We also realized that we needed to address the damages, the environmental damages that have already occurred and in which require that there should be rehabilitation of those uh, disturbed grounds and, and all that. So these, these, are, these are exactly what has to be done. And then you need to create alternative uh, opportunities for those who may not have to uh, necessarily do balance. And then, of course, support those who are doing it in the rightful way, in the lawful way. We have to support those who are doing small-scale mining in the legal way. We shouldn't lump all of them together in the name of balance. So, uh, 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 no, just off, top, off, off the top of my head, these are some of the things that I think we proposed. Dr. Hobbin, I'm grateful for your time. Unfortunately, we do not have the Deputy Minister, George Mekudika, who agreed to speak to us. When we do, when we do get him, we put that question of the seeming duplicity in efforts uh, to him, also being raised by the minority in Parliament. Let's do some other stories now. The Meteorological Agency says motorists must take precaution as visibility could reduce substantially following its detection of a heavy storm that could have damaging effect on weak buildings and uh, loose tree branches. According to GMEDS, there's a storm from the east and also the northern part of the country. Meanwhile, in the south, lightning and flash floods are also expected. Felicity Ahiapeno is the head of the Central Analysis and Fog casting office of the Ghana Meteorological Agency. This is the start of the season and if when it happens like this, we normally experience the strong winds. Mm. We normally experience thunder and lightning and we all know what comes with strong winds. Mm. Uh, either we have the dead branches that normally falls off from trees mm. or if you have a weak structure, this is the time that we'll be hearing collapse here and there. So this is the time that we need to attend to all these things. If you know your structure is old, I normally put it 30 to 40 years old. It is time that you should call the, uh, an expert 
architect to check it for you, especially the roof and then the wood. And then uh, if you have a tree by your house or wherever, mm. this is the time to go through and see whether there are some branches that are dead so you mm. can just prune them off. And then when it's raining and you are using the road, the motorist, this mm. is the time we should reduce our speed right. to between 20 to 40 kilometers per hour. I'm not an expert when it comes yes. to but, but that. You're predicting that visibility may drop significantly. Yes, yes, in a range, right. visibility also drops, mm. especially when it's moderate to severe. We have visibility at times less than 100 millimeter, 100 meters. Right. So when it happens like that, just reduce your speed. Yeah. Then the road right. too is a bit slippery or slick. You know, there is water on the surface with the tie being a rubber too mm. can also affect. So if you are re driving at a speed of 80 kilometers per hour and the road is free for you, that you should know that you are going to drive higher mm -hmm. in terms of the 80 kilometers you are thinking that you are doing because there is no friction there. So this is the time that we should. When I was coming around GBC, a car just bumped into the other. So those who normally drive closer to themselves on the road, this is the time that you should give that gap. In the western region, more than 400 residents of Anglo Beach, a community in the Shama district, have been displaced by tidal waves. Anglo Beach, for several years, has been bearing the brunt of tidal waves as over 90% of homes there have been washed away by the sea. Some of the affected residents spoke to Johnny's. This tidal wave, eventually, it has been happening to us for a very long time. Let's say since 1995. That's my date I, I keep in my mind. So, as, uh, recently one, it, it started uh, last four days ago, but yesterday one has been very serious and massive one that causes us things. Our properties have gone, only, only thankful to God that nobody died. That, that's what we can thank to God for, but properties have been destroyed. As you can see for yourself, houses and our, uh, let's say, uniforms and dresses that we're using have been buried into ground. You can't find some of them, but thankful to God that nobody died. So we need help. We need help. Anguna Beach need very serious help. It should be very immediate, Im immediate help. Immediate help. If it should be relocation, uh, less uh, relocation or sea defense, it should be very immediately. We are not safe here. Be two o'clock that way. If we are bringing them, we need to know. All started all by soul. All the solana, Obey and Wama, Obubu and Dano Rof Rof. I'm much so I want a man who boo second ones, or if I frame. So I'm a young man, I said, Wah, you, you, maybe, you're poor, a bang, you're poor, I'm a child, I'm a boy, and cry. Baby, I bow down. Young man, so I said, Yeah, a broom swing sky, you, a pronafoco, and see, you're born, I'm a boy. Yeah, right now we are living at our uncompleted building, just behind us. And we are even afraid the sea might come for it later, very soon. And so that's why we, we are trying to take some of our items out so that we will not get everything lost. I'm sure all these things are because of the uh, rapid um, global warming that's happening across the world. So uh, I would advise them to actually get places that are far away from the sea and live at safer places and then also we can prevent this by uh, taking care of how we we, we we have to protect the environment and then so that uh, uh, we can limit the extent to which this this thing can go i went to my auntie's house to see something there so when i came back i see everything in the water the place is flooded ah, i went to see my aunties everything is in the water so i tried to help him when i came back again everything all my things is uh, destroyed 
we, we don't have any help now. So we are pleading the government to come and help us, support us, so that we can get a new place to stay now. If the government can help us to locate the place for us so that we can move here to that place and stay here and have a peace of mind and safety. Correspondent in Natalia Kwanza reports the people are now ready to relocate to a proposed new site. For the first time, Anlaw Beach has been hit by a destructive tidal wave. The situation has become an annual ritual whereby households and properties are often destroyed by tidal waves. The community, which lies in between the Pra River and the sea, now has about 90% of households swept into the sea, making the occupants homeless. The affected residents were spotted either counting their losses or carrying the few items they could salvage into their new place of abode, which is either with some family members or the church. District Chief Executive for Shama Ebenezer Dazi, together with some members of the District Security Council, were in the community to access the situation. According to the DCE, a land allotted for their relocation has become a point of litigation by two families. And if you look at how people have been displaced, I mean, it's, it's very bad. And so we spoke to them and we gave them the assurance that something is going to be done. That is to move them permanently to the resettlement area. That's what we've agreed on. They themselves have agreed that they are ready to move, and so we are also ready to help them. We know there are disputes about the land, and on Friday we are calling all those involved and then talk to them that we can't wait any longer. Life is very important, and so we can't sit down on concern for us to waste life and properties. So we move them, when you have any case, come to us for us to settle. Assembly member for Anlaw Beach, Samuel Bolu, bemoaned the fact that over 90 households in the once beautiful community have been washed away. He, however, was happy with the intervention of the district assembly towards resettling the people. The tidal wave was so high, said that it washes away so many houses around the coast. And then today, as we see here, the Nadmo uh, boss himself came from Accra, brought some items, some relief items to the community. And then the DC and the MP has also assured the community that they will be moving to a new site. So, I mean, you could see that, that the community is so much happy. For the last three days, we have lost about 30 houses. But if you add up, you make it cumulatively, I would say it will be in hundreds. Here, as the Director General for the National Disaster Management Organization, Eric Nana Ajiman Prempe, who visited the community with some relief items. There was a tidal uh, waves uh, disaster that affected the people of Anwar Beach. This is not the first time. In 2017, I was here. It happened, and uh, we keep on advising them to move to the safer, safest place. But when we came today, we were told that um, there was some land litigation. Because of that, they couldn't move to the place. But we are grateful to the MP and the DC. They've been able to settle most of the land litigations. And you could see, the 2017, when we came, the people were not willing to move to the new site. Today, they are all willing. I'm so happy. All of them are willing to move to the new site. And that is what we thank God for. So we are here, one, on behalf of the president and government to empathize with them for what has happened to them and also to present some relief items to the people also so that is why we are here it is a sad thing but we thank god there was no death record or other human incidents for joy news in athalia kwanza and law beach let's go to zoom now and speak to george ac who is director of communications for nadmo thank you very much sir, for your time you're joining us prime so there have been other incidents of floods and tidal waves recorded elsewhere within this week and the previous week uh, question is are you ready for this season yes my brother nadmo is ready uh, for the season 
What have you put in place to ensure that we do not have uh, such levels of devastation when we have the floods coming, when it rains, and uh, all the related matters? Yeah, thank you. Uh, we, we, we have taxed our, all our offices uh, from the region to the district level to uh, do community sensitization, and they've already identified safe havens. Uh, my brother, because most of the places are low-lying, and you cannot immediately evacuate the people or get them out of those places, we identify safer places on higher grounds that they can move to uh, for safety when the floods are catching up with them. And then after the race, they can get back uh, to their place. And then our officers, too, uh, have been trained, search and rescue. In case of any uh, emergency, anybody trapped anywhere, our team can be deployed there uh, to go uh, and save them. Uh, these are measures. And then we continue with the community sensitization uh, mm -hmm. about because the people know where they live, uh, it's not safe, uh, what they ought to do. And by next week, uh, under the leadership of our Director General and team will be visiting some of the flood prone areas. Uh, we know, in partnership with the assemblies, uh, the certain is ongoing in, in some places, and uh, Dreadmaster is continuously dredging the Odor place. You know, uh, a circle at the Braca area are flood prone, and, and seriously, uh, if things are not done properly and the people conscientized, uh, mm -hmm. the rains come and will be telling the same old stories. We hope this year is not going to be like that. I've not heard you talk about relief items. Do you have enough in store? <laughs> Uh, yeah, we, we, we will be doing pre-positioning. We have four warehouses. Uh, we'll be getting stock. The ones that we have, we are giving out to these uh, victims, but we know definitely we'll be restocking and then doing pre-positioning in all the regional capitals uh, before the heavy rain set in. So for, for what we, you we, have we now, for what you have now, what is the extent? How far can it take you? Uh, I cannot uh, put a number of days to it. It will also be dependent uh, as a function of the number of people affected or the victims, uh, and then you can look at the number of days. Uh, I don't want to uh, 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 speculate or uh, hazard a guess. I, I want to be specific on uh, what we have, and then I can give you the actual figures and, and what it can do uh, in case of any emergency. So I want to hold on with that for now. And is there special attention being paid to uh, the northern part of the country because of uh, what we've seen in the past, especially when it comes to uh, flooding in, in those areas? Definitely, definitely. But fortunately, uh, in this phase one, the March to May, June forecast by Matthew uh, is mostly uh, in the south. Down south. Uh, th yes, the heavy ones will, will affect the northern sector in the second uh, phase. So that is the uh, re re respite we've gotten for now. So we'll be focusing more on the south. Uh, but the north, you know, when, when the rains come in, is in the second part, and then the back dam also. Uh, so yes, we, we continue with the conscientization there. And when the time comes, we will also launch to Operation Thunderbolt, what we call Operation Thunderbolt, uh, to go and station some of, some of our officers from other districts, other regions and headquarters to go and help the people uh, in the northern part of the country. That is part of our annual plan. Mr. AC, I'm grateful for your time. That's the Director of Communications for the much. National Disaster Management Organization, NADMO. Now, Minister for Sanitation and Water Resources, Cecilia Abnadapa, says government has so far invested 1.5 billion CDs to improve access to portable water across the country. Speaking at a stakeholders' breakfast meeting, the minister reiterated government's commitment to the sector as it is fundamental to the target set in maternal and child health poverty reduction, quality education, and the general socioeconomic well-being of citizens. Frank Wolanyo, Nyonato's report, right to you. Safe drinking water and improved sanitation are both an enabler of poverty reduction and a catalyst for growth and socioeconomic development. In recent times, Ghana has made strides in its quest towards achieving the National and Sustainable Development Goals target for safe drinking water. The Ghana Statistical Service, in its population and housing census, revealed that the proportion of the country's population with access to basic drinking water services is 87.7. 7. 
and this varies substantially between urban and rural settlement. At a stakeholders' conversation on the best ways to bridge the gap, participants called for a concerted effort from government in addressing this shortfall. Because when we, we say 97% coverage in urban areas when it comes to water, that's huge. That's a lot. But yes, the disparities are there. there sometimes there are issues with water quality. All those things have to be dealt with, but things are being done in stages. And just like the chief executive mentioned, we still have the regional disparities when it comes to water supply, even in the urban areas. Acting Director, Environment, Health and Sanitation at the Sanitation and Water Resources Ministry used the meeting to draw attention to the effect of climate change in the provision of water. One of the things that we have also not focused so much attention on is the issues around funding. And I think we need to be open and then discuss it passionately. As we speak now, according to SWA 2021 data, Ghana is doing around 0.08% of the GDP in terms of investment into sanitation. It also came to light that as the country makes giant strides in the water sector, same cannot be said about environmental sanitation. According to the 2021 Population and Housing Census, only 42.6% of Ghana's population have access to basic sanitation facilities, a situation stakeholders believe needs improvement. Another thing is also even the, the, the culture. Our, our culture, there's something very fashionable and wrong with our culture when it comes to certain behaviors. I think there was an earlier forum that I was exchanging with the, the National Director for Well Vision. He mentioned he was from Malawi. And said, ah, I remember this, my Malawian friend, we were all serving on an African Society board and we used to meet. Then one day in the conversation, I just mentioned that our sanitation coverage is 14%. The guy nearly died of laughter. That on her part, the Minister for Sanitation and Water Resources, Cecilia Abinadapa, said government is on course to establish the National Sanitation Authority to help in regulating operations in the country's wash sector. If you take uh, provision of toilets, household, we have four varieties. We have the Digni Loo, we have the uh, Pit One, which is improved. Then we have the biodigesters that we are propagating now because it uses less space and we can separate the liquid and the uh, solid. Among some of the recommendations arrived at at the stakeholders breakfast meeting is for government to place greater priority, political commitment and increased investment in the water and sanitation sectors. This is Johnny Prime. Still to come, Ghana Education Service calls for police investigations into allegations that some of its top officials and staff at the Education Ministry are extorting money from parents to place their children in certain schools. The General actually wrote to the Ghana Police Service, to IGP. He also wrote officially to NIB, former BNI, um, for independent investigations into some of these claims. Details after the break, please don't go away. Thanks for staying with us here on Join News Prime. Now, the Ghana Education Service says it has formally requested police investigations into allegations that its top officials and staff of the Ministry of Education are extorting money from students to place them in some senior high schools. The computerized school selection placement system has this year been fraught with some challenges despite assurances from the GES that it has successfully placed almost 90% of students who took part in the exam. Speaking on the Super Morning Show, Deputy GES Director uh, in charge of quality and access, Dr. Kogna Ben Patando, said the service will get to the bottom of the issue. I assure the public that as Ghana Education Service, as the Ministry of Education, we are really, really focused on ensuring that there is a transition from junior high school to senior high school for all students who are eligible to, tra to transition. Uh, so we do recognize, uh, just like Kojo said, that this will be an annual issue. 
We have also, however, seen that over the years, the challenges are going down. There are new ones that are coming. And right off the bat, I know that it is one of the things that we have talked about is the idea of, uh, of corruption, that people are charging monies. And this year, um, the, we are very, very serious about it because fingers are pointing to senior people within the ministry as well as the Ghana Education Service. Mm. I can tell you an authority that uh, yesterday, my director general actually wrote to the Ghana Police Service, to IGP. He also wrote officially to NIB, former BNI, um, for independent investigations into some of these claims. To other stories now, construction of the Trader District Hospital in the Ashanti region is progressing, but at a slow pace. That's according to the District Chief Executive of Ichima Kwanuma, Prince Kakari, who is dissatisfied with the pace of progress on the project, which is part of Government Agenda 111. The DCE says the project's speed could have been better. To kickstart the construction of the Agenda 111 project, President Akufado in August 2021 Cut the sword for work to start on the Traded District Hospital in the Makwangoma District in the Shanti region. The president, in his recent State of the Nation address, emphasized the completion of all of the hospital project before he leaves office in 2025. DC Fatima Kwangoma Prince Kakari told Love FM work is steadily progressing at the site despite the slow pace. He will, however, not explain the cause of delay. The pace, I mean, as I'll put it, has not been what we expected. But as you can see, work is steadily progressing at the site. From here, I'm going to the site. We had a site meeting yesterday. Everything is going according to plan. But some few skirmishes here and there, we are resolving it. By the close of the, this month, everything will be resolved. And we'll see how speedy the work will progress. Each of the Agenda 111 hospitals will be built at the cost of 12.8 million US dollars. And another 4.8 million US dollars would be spent to equip them. Each of the facilities is expected to be completed within 18 months. Meanwhile, district police headquarters has been commissioned trader to beef up security at the area. The DC says police operations will be enhanced with a new office. It will enhance security, promote security, promote businesses, promote safety of citizens in our district. As I indicated during my comments, I made the comments that Achimako Aroma is one of the fastest Going districts in Ashanti region. And therefore, having two di district commands in my district is a very welcome and refreshing news. So it will very much enhance and update the security situation in the district. The police infrastructure was put up by the chief of trade with the support of other stakeholders. Nana Nubinstra the third called on the citizens of trade to respond to calls for developmental project. <laughs> I thank everyone who has contributed to the success of putting up this district police headquarters. Many of the developmental projects you have started, including Trade Market, I am therefore calling on all the citizens of Trade to respond to the calls for developmental projects. Reporting for Joy News, Obidi Shio for Trade. From health, let's go to agriculture now. Fertilizer prices are rising, affecting farmers' cost of production adversely. This is compelling some farmers to abandon farming altogether, with others reducing their levels of production. My colleague, Samo Kujo. War on Ukraine has had several impact on the world. Even the world's fertilizer supplies will be badly affected. And the CEO of Ghana's Cocoa Board, Boahin Edu, is cautioning farmers about a possible shortage. The basic um, ingredients or elements needed in producing fertilizers and other chemicals are going to be difficult to come by. So um, we have to brace ourselves um, for the coming years maybe one or two years. Mr. Edu says we should brace ourselves for higher cost of fertilizers in the coming years. And expect that prices of fertilizers are not going to be the same. You know, even getting the quantities, the fertilizers, the quantities, because 
essentially um, you know the, the, the very basic elements that are needed to produce the fertilizers will not be there because of the war. So how do we overcome the scare? Could organic farming be the game changer? I caught up with a young farmer around Lashibi, Frederick Doku, who is experimenting this type of farming. Uh, this moringa here, the, the moringa can be used to uh, grow vegetables. Mm -hmm. The moringa leaves you can blend and spray it on the on, on the leaves, the foliar part of the plants. Okay. Yes. Um, you can also soak the leaves in water for two to three weeks. Then you pour it under the plant. Okay. Uh, then the plant uh, thrives. It, 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 uh, land preparation, you use manure, charcoal, okay, so uh, no you manure. mix it with the soil. What kind of manure do you use? Cow dung, uh, yeah. chicken droppings. Uh, they all help the plant to, to grow well. They, they provide nutrients for the, um, the soil. Organic farming may seem the way to go, but it has its own ramifications, and Ghana must move early to look into this to help the country's agriculture. The earlier, the better. For Joy News, I am Samuel Kojo Brace. Now, if you consume aphrodisiacs, you have to stop immediately. Well, doctors say obeying this instruction is a simple step to saving your life. Nephrologist Dr. Charlotte Osafo revealed that many cases of kidney failures have been linked to the increased consumption of aphrodisiac, especially among the youth. According to her, it is destroying the function of the kidney, which eventually kills the patient. Listen to her explain why you must stop its use. She spoke on the Super Morning Show. Prevention is key, and prevention is something, as I worked, I've told you, I've worked with kidney patients for a very long time. And it's always very painful, you know, and uh, difficult when you see young people. In our environment, it's usually the young people who get affected with uh, kidney problems. Uh, unlike the developed countries where people get to like 60 years before they start getting those problems, we is usually between 20 to 50 years and people get, get that prob that, that, those uh, kidney issues. So for me, my advice would be that it's important that one, uh, we check. We need to be checking. And how do you check? It's very simple, very, very simple. One, check your blood pressure. Yeah. Make sure you are checking your blood pressure regularly. It's very, very important. Two, uh, every year, at least for once, check your urine. It's nothing difficult. It's just urine. You are throwing it away. Just take it there. Let them just put a stick inside. And they will tell you whether there's protein. You're not supposed to have proteins in your urine. So when they just put a stick there, they will tell you, ah, this, you have protein. And they can easily deal with it and get rid of it but if you don't check you will not know and for the young men i have advice for you those are fro aphrodisiacs that uh, you take you don't know what yes you want to perform but usually if you eat well you exercise well you should be able to perform you know wonderfully exactly. yes so please Avoid the aphrodisiac. Try and stay away from they them. They shouldn't kill themselves. No, they, they don't have to. They should just make sure they eat well, they exercise, you know, and then uh, I believe that uh, everything should be fine. I went to the wise. Well, she has a dream to become a journalist, a dream which she wrote down when she sat for the 2021 BCE. From Tamale, 16-year-old Ibiti Sam, has gained admission to the Accra Girls Senior High School. Today, she arrived at the school where she hopes to inch closer to realizing her dream. My colleague, Manuel Cranton, went to meet her and now reports. When I was coming here, I woke up very early. Then my mom brought me to the station and left. So I was in the bus saloon. I was sleeping a lot in the bus. Like, I will sleep, wake up, sleep, wake up. 16-year-old Yehuza. Ibtisam Mpahia, recounting the 382-mile journey from the heart of northern Ghana in Tamale all the way to the national capital, Accra. Gaining admission into Accra Girls High School is a dream come true for her. She really cannot hide her excitement. I searched for the school on the net, so I saw pictures of the school and history about the school. So I also decided to come to the school and pursue my studies. Ibtisam is one of the over 500 girls 
who are on campus for the very first time. As freshers, their pink checkered uniforms set them apart from their seniors, or rather, their sisters. When you see any form to sister, any mistake is, you need to come down for her to tell before you continue. And you can't call them by their names, unless you ask sister to it. For example, you can't come by stolen, unless you ask sister so to so it. And when you are fetching water and you see any form to sister with their buckets, you need to uh, take off the bucket for her to fetch before you finish. These are just a few of the rules here which must be obeyed by all. Calling them sister is not new to me, but fetching water and the sister will come and you now have to take off your bucket and she fed before you. That's what is new to me. I'll cry later. <laughs> As Ibtisam thinks about all the learning and relearning awaiting her, the loud siren goes off. And like Agi Shakor, the unmistakable statue of a student with her face buried in her book, the Tamale girl is immediately reminded of the real reason she's in Accra in the first place. <laughs> to begin her journey of becoming a world-class journalist. I want to be a journalist or a news presenter. I just have passion for it. I'll do all the exercises given by the teachers and I'll try my best to participate in the lessons going on. Like if a teacher asks a question and I know, I'll raise up my hand and answer the question. Okay, I'm not intimidated by the students here or because they are from here, so no, I'm not. You're watching John News Prime with me and this minute. We're taking a break on Warrior 10. We have showbiz for you. And IB is here. He has the very latest in showbiz. Good evening to you. Good evening, Ernest. How are you doing? I'm fine. Yourself? Mm, I'm great. I was so motivated by the last story that you did on mm, this. The school. young lady. She yeah. wants to be a journalist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just work hard, pass your exam, <laughs> and uh, who knows? We'll be working together someday. Very, very possible. So, in the world of entertainment, well, there was a discussion this morning on Hit FM, the morning show on Hit FM, Daybreak Hits, um, solutions to find how Ghana music can do more than it's doing on the global front now. Mm -hmm. Well, one sound engineer that they spoke to via phone. But, but I think that we're doing well. No, 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 we do, we're doing like good now. A lot of hit songs yes, 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 going yes, global, yes. Yes. from Kitty to Kelvin Boy. And recently the... Kitty Kwame Eugene film, the Indian yeah, the, the, the Camido now. song. I didn't know it was, honestly. You didn't know Shigo was Camido? I'm telling you. You're lost. You're <laughs> lost in Look, world. I thought it was a Nigerian song. No. Maybe because we are producing, the tunes sound more Nigerian these more, days. More Afro beats? Yeah, I only found out in the gym this week that it's, it's Ghanaian. Oh, you're pushing up. Okay, that's good. Oh, we'll that. <laughs> so there was discussions this morning, and one sound engineer who has had a lot of hits for our um, superstars, his name is Wei Yoting. Mm. He believes that uh, musicians here in this country are not paying sound engineers good monies, and if they should start paying them good monies, at least they will be doing some good works for them. Let me put it. Let, let me let me use one of our best engineers that we have in, in the system. You engage somebody like uh, you. And uh, you go like, oh, at least I want to get my song uh, mixed and mastered to a certain level. And obviously, don't forget that you need to use his laptop to also mix and master a song. But if you really want to get the job done, pay how he is to be charged or how he needs to be paid, then you will really get it. Because you can't walk up to these people and expect to pay 500 or 1000 and expect him to, you know, mic things, uh, Open some pre, uh, you know, on some preamps and start taking your song to, re you know, reproduce the entire thing to suit the standard. So sometimes the charges that our artists in this country would want to pay for that quality, oh my God, it's 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 it's, it's sad. The most musicians in this country do not pay the engineers well. 
Mm. Well, that's come from where you're saying. So who, who do they pay well? Because everyone in the chain is complaining. Yes, everyone in the chain seems to be complaining. The musicians will complain that event organizers are not paying them well. But, I mean, quality is quality. quality if it's good, quality. it will speak for yeah, itself. Yeah, if, if, you spend, if you spend a lot of money on your project, it will, mm. it will go well for you. Yeah. I don't know what you have heard people say about the, the very famous slap, the Oscar slap. The infamous. The infamous slap. <laughs> Um, well, you tell us what others are well, saying. Well, you know that a lot of people have been talking about it and there's been discussions going on and on about yeah. it. Well, Tommy Unenforcing has had his bits on this issue. Well, Ace broadcaster Tommy Unenforcing, who was in the studios of Joy 99.7 FM uh, for Showbiz 8, is it believes that Chris Rock went just too far as a comedian. Uncle Tom. Yo. Would you slap somebody for love? Uh. <laughs> In fact, I add the E to it, I the E slap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, I, I think, I think um, it actually depends on the depth of what the person is talking about. Hmm. You see, um, what's her name gave a very good uh, analysis of her perspective on the issue. Yeah. But you see, as a comedian, uh, this is where I probably would disagree with Whitney. Uh, yeah, no, not not Whitney. No, Whitney. What Will Smith said. Will Smith, okay. Yeah, about the fact that you know you are supposed to take up all that nonsense that people are talking about. But you see, we are all human with different emotions. We act, we react differently to everything that happens. Um, <coughs> like Whitney rightly said, it's it it could be pent up emotions. Yeah. Okay. But for me, as somebody who has done comedy. I think that you know you don't take anybody for granted. Um, you you should know your parameters. You should know which line to cross, and how to react to certain things. And like uh, Whitney rightly said, you know, pent up emotions and stuff like that. I th I think personally that uh, Chris uh, went a little too far. In that you see, here's a lady who has cherished her whole body, including her hair and what have you and so for you to suffer from this disease if i should use that word obviously is devastating okay uh i remember you saying that before we started the show that you know she could have worn a wig but everybody again like you rightly said could react differently skins react differently to everything well so there you have Tommy and Fosno also there, there are his. people who disagree with him yes, there's I mean, a flip side to it there's a flip side to it I mean mm -hmm. it's brought about a lot of discourse both for uh, for Will Smith mm -hmm. some for the others who one. say that this also the slap has opened sort of the floodgates for attack on comedians on comedians you know but it depends on really how you... Well, regardless it. of that fact, Will Smith, his, in his apology, he actually affirmed that he does not condone violence. Violence. Yeah. A good one there. Mm -hmm. Ibi, thank you very much You're for welcome. that show. Yes. And uh, that's how we wrap up. Uh, John News Prime, many thanks for your company. Please log on to myjohnline.com. you find many stories there. I'm Ernest Mino. Up next is Prime Business. <laughs>